Okay, thank you very much. Okay, yeah. so today we are going to speak about Green's conjecture and the generation methods. So now it's time to come to the second topic of uh, of my uh, <coughs> series of lectures. So let me recall from uh, the last week that if we have x in projective space, <coughs> a rational normal scroll of dimension um, d, then uh, we have the following Betty number, graded Betty numbers. beta i i plus 1 or b i 1 in the other notation is i times, and let me just be sure that I have the numbers right, n minus d plus 1, choose i plus 1. <coughs> so that comes from uh, the Egon North code complex. So the idea is just that the, any scroll uh, is given by uh, the vanishing of uh, 2 by 2 minors of uh, matrix of variables um, and the uh, number of columns is the codimension plus 1. The number of columns was that, you know, remember D capital D, which was the degree, and the degree is, uh, since this is a variety of minimal degrees, the codimension plus one. So if we write carefully the egon norcode complex, then we get uh, these uh, Betty numbers. So let's pass now to, uh, to curves. So let's take C, a non-hyperliptic, uh, hyperelliptic, curve of genus G and uh, take the uh, canonical embedding and suppose that C is of gonality uh, K. What does this give? So we have then um, the uh, G1K on C. Uh, so if we take the elements in a, in a fiber of this G1K, they will span a, a plane. But what, what kind of plane is this? Because this moves, it's a G1K. And we embed C by the canonical uh, bundle. This will span a K minus two plane. So each fiber spans a uh, k minus 2 plane. So if we take the union, take the union of the fibers of these, uh, these spans, and then get the scroll. And uh, this scroll is uh, of dimension uh, k minus 1. So if we uh, write the Betty numbers uh, for this scroll, we get um, B, let's see, what was the uh, uh, G minus uh, K plus 1 of this scroll uh, is G minus uh, K plus 1. So in particular, since the uh, causal cohomology of uh, KP1 of the scroll is embedded in the uh, causal cohomology of the curve, well, of course, this, the curve is contained in the scroll, right? Uh, then this, this means that VP1 
of C is at least, uh, sorry, it'd be uh, G minus K plus 1, 1 of C is at least G minus K plus 1, which is different from 0. So this is one uh, thing which we get. So if C is of gonality, of gonality K, then we get this, uh, this non-vanishing of Kazul cohomology, which comes from, from the scroll, actually. But we can uh, do better than that. So uh, I mentioned uh, last week the non-vanishing result of Green and Lazarsfeld, which for scrolls uh, gives uh, the same. But if we decompose kc as a times kc minus a with a and kc minus a uh, at least two sections, which means h0 of a bigger than 2, h1 of a bigger than 2, meaning that a contributes to a cliff. And uh, we can take a to compute uh, Clifford, the Clifford index, then if we write carefully uh, the numbers which appear in uh, the non-vanishing result of green lazarsfeld we get a slightly better result. Uh, sorry, this is uh, should be g minus k and not minus k plus 1. Sorry for that. So it's g minus k. So we get g minus c minus 2, 1 of c is different from 0. Well, of course, if the gonality is uh, cliff plus 2, it's uh, exactly the same. But there might be curves that have uh, gonality cliff plus 3. And this is slightly better than, than this one. And the difference is that, so green Lazarsfeld asphalt has two, um, two options. Either you split the bundle as a, a sum of a, a pencil plus uh, something residual. And then you get basically the same construction as uh, the one using scrolls and Igor Nordcott. Sorry, there's, there's also an H here, Nordcott complex. Or if you split it as something some um, linear systems which uh, have a higher dimension, then uh, this non-vanishing actually comes from, the Gra from a Grassmannian. So you can find a map to a Grassmannian G to something, and then these non-zero classes come from the non-zero classes of a Grassmannian. So in green Lazarsfeld construction, here we have two types of uh, classes, either scroller classes, if we uh, decompose the canonical as a pencil plus some plus residual or Grassmannian classes. But I'm, I don't want to go to, into details, so it's enough to... For, uh, <coughs> for, uh, for applications, we will just need to use this, uh, this bound. We don't need to, to get into Grassmannian uh, stuff. Um, okay, anyway, so green... Uh, Green uh, asked the following question, is this optimal? And the answer should be this famous conjecture of Green, which is yes, meaning that Kp1 of C, well, of a canonical curve, is zero for any P at least g minus c plus, uh, sorry, minus 1. <coughs> so that amounts to proving that k g minus c minus 1, 1 of c is 0. So let's analyze some, uh, some cases. Why, why is uh, this case, this canonical case, uh, interesting? Well, it's interesting be because of many reasons. 
But one reason is that the Betty table uh, has a very nice shape. So the Betty table has the following shape. So we start from uh, <coughs> the uh, upper right corner. So we have a 1. Then um, we might have uh, something, a block of uh, non-zero syzygies here. <coughs> and then uh, some something here. It will stop at g minus 2. So that's the g minus 2. This is 0. This is 1, 2, 3, 4. And this is 1. Well, it, it has basically four rows. It has g minus 3 columns. And this is symmetric. If we draw the center here, it's symmetric uh, with respect to the center. So that's uh, the symmetry comes from duality. So basically, it's uh, ser duality involved here. <coughs> so in particular, we see uh, so Green's conjecture is about the vanishing of this row, and at the end of the uh, of, uh, of the uh, resolution, uh, the uh, the tail of the resolution. So we want. Uh, these numbers vanish starting from g minus c minus 1. So that would be the uh, starting point of the vanishing. For We know for sure that this is g minus c minus 2. This is non-zero because of uh, green lazarus uh, non-vanishing result. OK, but this, this is the same as the vanishing of on the other, on the other part. And uh, for example, so the curve is is non-hyperelliptic. So uh, it has the property n zero, um, which uh, uh, means that this guy. Uh, this is equivalent to k g minus 2, 1 c is um, 0. So that, that is um, the theorem of Max Noether. So non hyperelliptic-hyperelliticity uh, seen in this way with syzygies is uh, nothing but uh, the projective normality proved by Max Noether. But then we can uh, go and analyze what happens with the next step. And uh, the next step, we expect that so Green, Green's conjecture for the next step predicts that if the curve is uh, not trigonal nor plane quintic, Then we have property N1, meaning the vanishing not only here, but also here, which uh, basically means that the curve is projectively normal, which we knew, and the ideal is generated by quadrix. Well, th that's a famous, the famous uh, Theorem by Enriquez Petri, and there are some, some others. Um, but it's basically Petri. Petri, who, who by the way was a high school teacher, he has very few papers, but he was a teacher in Landau in Germany. Landau, Germany? Yes. Landau is the eastern part of Germany? Uh, I don't know. I'm not very good in the 
German geography, but... Uh, was the, the person when German was divided into two? Uh, no, he, no, he's a student of Emmy Nutter. So, so he, he, yeah, he was. So he wrote this paper in 1922. Ah, uh -huh. So long before the uh, division of uh, uh -huh. of Germany. Uh -huh. I don't know how much did he live, but uh, not, not in the getting it. Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and the next step, if we go one step further. Uh, we can see that uh, if the curve is not orthogonal nor plane sextic, uh, then uh, not only the ideal is generated by quadrix, but the relations between these uh, among these quadrix are uh, linear. And the uh, relations among quadrix are uh, linear, meaning that are generated by linear linear relations. So this is a, a, a theorem due to uh, Schreier. And uh, Vazan. It was proved almost uh, simultaneously by completely different methods. So Schreier uh, improved uh, Petrie's analysis. Uh, that's actually the, the title of the paper on Petrie's analysis uh, of the ideal of a uh, canonical curve, something like that. And Schreier uses, uh, uh, and uh, Vazan uses uh, uh, vector bundle techniques. So the uh, methods are rather different, but the, the result is the same. OK, so th there is a lot of uh, evidence for <coughs> uh, Green's conjecture. But the most important, probably, uh, in my opinion, the most important, uh, important result is the following theorem, which is due to Vazan and uh, Hirschowitz Ramanan, which says the following. If C is uh, a curve of odd genus uh, 2k plus 1, g equals 2k plus 1, and the uh, gonality maximal gonality, gonality which is uh, k plus 2, then um, k, uh, k1 of c is 0. So observe that uh, that's, uh, that proves uh, two uh, things at once. So the first one is that, so it contains the statement that any curve of odd genus and maximal gonality has automatically maximal Clifford index. And uh, uh, it proves Green's conjecture for these curves. So it implies that maximal gonality also uh, gives a maximal Clifford index. In the odd genus case, for even genus, genus is, not, is not true, that's, that's false. So we have Green's conjecture, basically Green's conjecture for any curve of odd genus and uh, maximal gonality. And I'm going to explain the, uh, the, the proof idea. So there are general curve or any any curve any curve, any any curve. curve. Yeah. yeah any curve any. that's somehow the miracle in uh, in this story 
Because by semi-continuity, which we discussed in the first lecture, if you have a vanishing for one curve, then this will propagate on a, an open set. So if you have vanishing for one curve, that will give vanishing for an open set in the moduli space. But you don't know what, what's this open set actually. So it's uh, abstractly an open set, but you, you don't know what is it. Uh, this is a much more precise statement. So it says that this is valid, this vanishing is valid on the whole open set where you expect this, this vanish to happen. And uh, there are two, two things. So the idea is to uh, compare Uh, two divisors in uh, the moduli space Mg. So that's the moduli space of curse of genus G. So the first one is a famous divisor, is the locus of curves with non maximal gonality. So it's the locus of curves with the G1 K plus 1. So that was considered by uh, Harrison Mumford. So it's been extensively studied by Harrison Mumford in their famous Inventionist papers from the 80s, where they, they proved that Mg is uh, of general type, for G at least uh, 25. <coughs> and they used this divisor to, to reach the conclusion. And the, uh <coughs> their idea is based that on, on the computation. So Harris Mumford compute the class uh, of this divisor, dk plus 1, in uh, peak of mg. Well, peak of mg is cyclic, is generated by one class, which is called the uh, Hodge class. And they compute the coefficient of this uh, divisor class with respect to the uh, to the generator of the uh, Picard group. <coughs> but it's, it's very hard um, work to do. So it's, it's a big part of their paper, this computation, to, to find the, uh, what's the class of this divisor. However, it's something fundamental. So that's the first divisor. <coughs> um, so it is a, a genuine divisor. And then the second one is what I call D prime k plus 1, is the locus of curves which failed to satisfy this uh, vanishing. KK1, C is different from zero. Well, there are two questions. So first of all, uh, why uh, is D prime K plus one uh, different from MG? So it might happen that this is the whole, the whole space. The second question is why is it a divisor? So uh, these are uh, the first question is actually very hard. And that's uh, um, the work of uh, Claire Vazin, which is uh, the most uh, important Could work. There, why mg n zero is k g minus two e one e two n zero? The product normality property is uh, yeah is 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 the same because of duality. This corresponds to k zero. Yeah, this corresponds to K02. So N0 is the same as K02 for canonical curves, yes. And um, it's projective normality, which is automatic if the curve is not hyperelliptic. So in general, you, you, if you have a curve in a projective space in Pn, then can, Kn minus 1, 1 is different from 0 only if it's a rational normal curve, which uh, sort of makes sense. Because if the curve is not hyperelliptic, then the image of the canonical map is a rational normal curve in Pg minus 1. So the failure of uh, n0 uh, amounts to, to, to the same uh, 
to the same statement. Okay. Ah, let me use this uh, funny device. I like it very much. I should buy one. Um, <coughs> so the first question, so the answer to the first question is uh, the work of Claire Voisin. And I explained uh, in spring somehow her ideas, how to use uh, <coughs> Hilbert schemes um, and uh, a new interpretation of Kozul cohomology to prove this statement. So w uh, just let me remind you what was the idea is uh, find an example. And one typical example is uh, C in S. This is a K3 with uh, cyclic. Well, her proof was slightly different, but I will just keep it as simple as, as possible. So this uh, peak is generated by C. And uh, then uh, uh, we have KK1 of C is actually KK1 of S. And this is uh, 0. And she proves uh, vanishing. Um, so the advantage of working with K3 surfaces is that if you take a curve in a linear system and you restrict that linear system, then the causal cohomology of the of the uh, surface with values in that line bundle and the Kuzul cohomology of the canonical curve are isomorphic. And there are also many other advantages which I explained uh, when I discussed this. Um, so anyway, if you find an example then um, that gives you a strict inclusion in uh, MG. So that takes care of the first question. Now the second question, why is it a divisor? Well, uh, there is a way to produce divisors as the generacy loci of uh, morphisms between vector bundles. And in order to, uh, to answer this question, we should uh, take a closer look at this uh, object, KK1 of C. So what is KK1 of C? Just applying the, Kozul, uh, the definition of Kozul cohomology, you take this Kozul complex, which K plus one of K, C, which K of uh, H naught KC, tensor H naught KC, goes to wedge k minus 1 uh, h naught kc tensor h naught kc squared and so on and you take the cohomology here okay so kk1 is the cohomology uh, here of uh, this complex but we can write it differently so we, uh, we have a map from uh, wedge k h naught kc tensor h naught kc factored through wedge k plus one of h naught of kc. This is called uh, so you'll find it in literature as gamma k minus one of uh, c. So there is a shift of indices. And it goes to um, wedge k minus 1 h naught kc tensor h naught kc squared. And uh, the causal cohomology, if we denote this by f k minus 1, uh, the causal cohomology k k1 of c is the kernel of uh, fk minus 1. Um, now let's have a look at this guy. 
and try to shrink the, uh, the target. So the target is too big for our purposes. So try to shrink it a little bit. And now use the fact that we actually have a, a complex. So the image of this map will land in the kernel of the next map. So if we take the next term, which is wedge k minus 2, h naught of kc, tensor h naught kc cubed, then um, we can replace this guy by the, the kernel of the, of the next map. But what is the kernel of the next map? So if we uh, look at the sequence mc h naught of kc tensor o, and goes to kc, goes to zero. So that's the kernel of the evaluation map of sections in the canonical bundle. Then uh, take powers, so we need wedge k minus one, and take global sections, then we get zero goes to, to h naught wedge k minus one mc. We can also twist by kc cubed, kc uh, sorry, kc squared goes to wedge k minus 1 h naught kc tensor h naught kc squared. So this guy identifies the kernel of the Kozul differential. the next causal differential. So we can actually replace this target by this guy. So the, uh, the moral is that so uh, the moral is that uh, get, uh, we get a sequence uh, an exact sequence zero to k k one of c to gamma k minus one of c f k minus one to this guy h zero wedge k minus one m c tensor k c squared and uh, the co kernel is k k minus one two of c goes to zero. Now the dimension of this guy, uh, the dimension, it's uh, really easy to compute is, uh, what is it? Is uh, uh, g choose k, so 2k plus 1 choose k times 2k plus 1 minus uh, g choose uh, k plus 1, so 2k plus 1 choose k plus 1. So that's the dimension. What about the dimension of the other guy? So now mc is uh, semi-stable. Now in characteristic 0, a tensor product of semi-stable is semi-stable. So in particular all the uh, tensor powers of mc are semi-stable. And now Again, in characteristic zero, the exterior powers are uh, direct summons in the tensor powers. So that means that wedge k minus 1 mc is semi stable. And if you write carefully the slope, then you see that this guy has no h1. So h1 of wedge k minus 1 mc tensor kc squared must be zero. That comes from, you just apply the duality and you compare the slopes and you see that the, what you obtain has no, uh, no sections. And then uh, h0 of wedge k minus 1 mc tensor kc squared is actually chi of the, the guy mc tensor kc squared which is computed by riemann roch And now the big surprise is that that's uh, really a miracle. It's the dimension of gamma k minus 1 of c. 
So these two guys have the same dimension. So that's one thing. And another thing is that these two guys globalize over the moduli space. So if we move the curve in a family, then these guys will move in, in families. So probably let me just explain a little bit. So, um, what we get at the end, at the end of the day, we get two uh, vector bundles of the same rank. Uh, F and G on MG and uh, a morphism morphism Phi from F to G who's the generation locus is a D prime K plus one so it's exactly, so you see, you imagine that this, these are fibers. This is the fiber of G over the point corresponding to C. This is the fiber of G. Uh, sorry, uh, this is of, of F and this is of G. Uh, and uh, if, if this is uh, non-zero, then the, uh, the morphism of vector bundles, bu vector bundles degenerates at that, that point. So the degeneracy locus coincides precisely with uh, with d prime k plus 1 and how is this constructed well we have cg over mg the universal curve let's not get into the details whether this is uh, this is uh, only a coarse moduli space and it's not a fine moduli space we can either you can overcome these difficulties either with, by working with the stack or if you wish you just restrict to the uh, locus of curves with non trivial uh, with no non trivial automorphisms and then you you get a genuine uh, universal curve over that so in general for the whole mg this this is the uh, moduli space of one pointed curves so the point here over a curve would correspond to the curve modul modulo the automorphism groups group sorry and um, but let's let's not get into these technicalities for the moment let's just assume that this is universal it's a really a universal curve and take pi the uh, the projection take omega pi the relative canonical and then uh, pi lower star of uh, Omega pi, as denoted by E, that's called the Hodge bundle, is a Frank, is a Frank G on MG. Okay, then you have, uh, if you pull it, pull it back, then you have pi upper star of E goes to Omega pi, goes to zero. So over each point. Um, this will give the uh, just the evaluation of uh, sections in the canonical bundle. So we can take m pi to be the, the kernel of this map. And now um, f will be wedge k e tensor e modulo wedge k plus one of e. It's clear that we have a morphism from which k plus 1 of e to, to the tensor product. You take, just take this quotient. And g will be wedge um, k minus 1 m pi tensor omega pi squared, something like that. And you have to take, uh, this is upstairs, so you have to take the uh, push forward downstairs. So that's somehow the, the uh, construction. 
and um, so you get the morphism and now uh, the idea is to compute a class ah uh, I should have said something so d prime d prime k plus one is the degeneracy locus of the morphism phi. So this is a morphism between vector bundles of the same rank. So a morphism between vector bundles of the same rank either degenerates everywhere or it degenerates along a divisor. These are the only possible classes. So th that implies that either d prime k plus 1 is the moduli space mg or d prime k plus 1 is a, a genuine divisor. But this was uh, ruled out by Vazan. So the, uh, we are left with this. this the the uh, the only possibility is that this is a divisor. And now uh, Hirschovitz and Ramanan compute the class of this divisor, which is slightly easier than computing the class of uh, d k plus one. So Hirschovitz and Ramanan compute the class of uh, d prime k plus one, and what they find is that this is really a multiple of dk plus one. So if they compare the class here uh, against the class of uh, Harris Mumford, then this is really k times this this one. And now um, we have to uh, observe one thing. that uh, set theoretically the support of d k plus 1 is embedded in d prime k plus 1 because if you have a g1 k plus 1 from the discussion at the beginning we have a scroll and if we have a scroll then we have a non-vanishing uh, uh, k k1 but not only so besides, from the, uh, um, again from the uh, discussion we had at the beginning, if you have an element in dk plus 1, um, so if c is in dk plus 1, not only that kk1 is different from 0, but kk1 has dimension at least k. Right, because this, this this is a k is the dimension of kk1 of the scroll. So if you have a g1 k plus one, that will give a k minus one dimensional scroll, which will have uh, exactly k syzygies. So the uh, the curve will have at least k syzygies. But this means uh, something very interesting. So you have f g, you have the morphism phi. And uh, you have this curve, and 5 degenerates uh, at, at the point C. This information says that the kernel, so not only it degenerates, but the kernel is of dimension at least k. This means that C enters with multiplicity at least k in. Uh, d prime k plus 1. So if you look now at this schematic structure, then uh, the uh, dimension of this kernel tells you the multiplicity of the point. What's the multiplicity of the point? So the multiplicity is at least k, k in d prime k plus 1. Aha. So we have this divisor which is included here. So this means that if we don't take the support, but we, we take k times this divisor as divisors, then we get k times this divisor is lower than or equal to, to this one. Meaning that the 
the difference is effective. But their class is the same. So this forces uh, the supports to be the same. So from here, we get dk plus 1 equals d prime k plus 1 set theoretically. So I chose, I chose this topic not only because it's, it's a really very deep result, but also because it can be applied in various other situations. Like Gabi Farkas also applied it in his uh, works on uh, causal divisors in moduli spaces. So the, the, uh, if, you, if you want, for example, to prove that the moduli space has uh, some Kodaira dimension, so uh, that the moduli space is of uh, general type, then you need to produce interesting divisors. So the, how can you produce a divisor in a moduli space? Either using Brinater theory and uh, producing s interesting cycles saying that you have some curves which are special from the Brillnutter uh, theory point of view. But then you, you get to, to into problems in computing the classes of this, uh, these divisors. Or you can uh, produce divisors as the generacy loci of morphisms of, uh, between vector bundles of the same rank. And then Kozul cohomology is here. Because Kozul cohomology can be computed in families. So this, actually this trick can be applied in various other situations. So it's, a, it's really a, a proof pattern that can work in many other situations. So you have, every time you want to prove a, a, st a similar statement, you need first to ensure that this degeneracy locus is not the whole thing, so that you, you need to produce a divisor. And then you need to, to, to compare the classes, to, do, to perform some divisor class computation. OK, so that closes the, uh, that closes the, uh, the proof. But you see, what's funny is that uh, somehow the hardest part is uh, to find an example, to prove that this is a genuine, uh, genuine divisor and is not to rule out the, the case when this is the whole thing, when this degenerates over the whole thing. Okay. And now uh, I should go into, probably I, I just begin today, and I, uh, I, finish, uh, I finish tomorrow. So that the this result extends over the boundary of uh, of the moduli space Mg. So this this extends to uh, stable curves. Just uh, a few words about stable curves. So if you want to compactify Mg, you need to add something at the, uh, at the border. And so Mg is not compact because you have families of uh, smooth curves which degenerate to singular curves. And there is no way to replace that sing central singular curve by a smooth curve. That's why the moduli space is not compact. But you can compactify it by adding a stable curve. So stable means that uh, the automorphism, so it's a nodal connected curve with a automorphism group finite. It's finite automorphism group. So for example, if you have uh, a P1, then uh, this P1 must intersect the, others, the other 
um, components in at least three points. So if you have P1 and another component intersecting in two points, this is not stable. So this is not, uh, this is not allowed. OK, and you have a similarly stable pointed curve. Uh, so you get another curve, again another curve, with marked points. And uh, the automorphism group of this uh, curve with the marked points must be finite. So if you mark, uh, for example, uh, you can you can have something like that a p1 intersecting another component in uh, in two points but then you have to to mark a point on p1 and uh, uh, the 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 marked points marked points are outside the nodes So you are not allowed to mark the nodes. So you only mark uh, what is outside. So for example, if you have another curve, uh, if, if you have um, yeah, something like that, you, you, you are not allowed to mark this, this point. Uh, well, you can ask me now, why is it compact? Because it looks like if you remove a point, what's left is something open. So why on Earth would this give to uh, to, to a compactification of uh, a moduli space of marked, a smooth marked uh, pointed curves? Well, it's simple because every time you feel the need to mark this point, a node, then you can blow it up. So just by blowing it up, you get, so if you, if you really want to, to, to mark this point, you better blow it up you get a P1, and you, you choose uh, a marking on, uh, on this uh, exceptional curve. So there is always a way to, to go around. OK, and then here you have the moduli space of uh, uh, pointed curves. Here you have the moduli space of uh, stable, uh, stable curves. And uh, this, if you look at mg bar, what you add, so mg is open here, and you add some divisors, delta 0, delta 1, and so on, where delta, delta i are divisors. And delta 0 will correspond to, so the general member is uh, irreducible. with one node. And delta i will have a general member with two components meeting in one point. So one would be uh, of genus i, and the other one of genus g minus i. So this is somehow, uh, this, that's the description of this. Uh, so this, these are irreducible. Delta i are uh, irreducible divisors. So that's what we had at the, at the uh, border. And now um, the extension to the uh, to nodal curves is that a curve in mg union delta 0 is a limit of k plus 1 smooth curves, meaning that uh, is in the closure of uh, delta k plus 1, right, in this uh, partial compactification of, of mg, if and only if kk1 
of let's uh, denote this by x. Kk1 of x is different from 0. So Kk1 of x denotes the uh, causal cohomology with values in the uh, uh, canonical bundle of, uh, of x. So it's exactly like uh, for uh, smooth curves, it's just uh, that this time is for, for singular curves. And the proof is not that complicated. Why is k plus 1 smooth curves? Sorry? What do you mean k plus 1 smooth curves? It's k plus 1 gonal. Gonal. Yeah. Gonal. Smooth curves. So it's a limit of uh, um, curves of uh, gonality k plus 1. So if you if you are in uh, actually this this statement is about delta zero because if you are in, in MG it's just Hirschovitz Ramana Nevaza, so that's uh, new for for delta zero. So um, as in the smooth case, get uh, uh, F and G vector bundles of the same rank and the morphism uh, phi from f to g whose degeneracy locus is delta k plus 1 tilde in m g tilde which is mg union delta zero. So this is the, the closure of, uh, uh, sorry, d prime k plus one, of d prime k plus one. So that's actually delta tilde k plus one. It's like in the smooth case, is the locus of curves with kk one of x different from zero. And now we, uh, so Hirschhoff, Raman, and Evazan proved that over the smooth locus, of, over Mg, this coincides with the uh, del de de k plus 1. So this is a, a de that's a divisor because uh, it's, uh, sorry, it's not a closure. No, it's not a closure. That's, that's the whole point. We should prove that it's a closure. So uh, please erase this. So it's this. Uh, it's just this uh, definition which uh, goes exactly as in the smooth case. Okay. So uh, the tilde prime k plus one is a divisor. So what can it be? So over M G, it coincides with uh, d k plus one. But there are two cases that can happen. Either when you add delta zero, delta zero can be a component of d prime uh, tilde, or so there are two cases, two possible cases. Divisor inside what? Mg union delta zero. Or yes. Yeah. 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 Divisor in Mg. Yeah. Yeah. It's always a divisor because. It cannot be the whole mg tilde because if it was the whole mg tilde, then also the restriction to mg will be the whole mg, and that that would contradict Vazan. So if it's not a divisor of over m, if it's a divisor of an mg, it's also a divisor of uh, the the compactification. So there are two possibilities. So either, so the first possibility is either delta zero is a component of delta tilde prime or delta tilde prime k plus 1 is the closure of delta prime k plus 1 which is by Hirschovitz uh, Ramanan Vazan is uh, delta k, uh, d k plus 1 sorry so uh, what we try to prove is that we are in the second situation that uh, a curve has kk1 different from zero if and only if it's a limit 
of curves in uh, the k plus one. So we need to rule out need to rule out uh, the first case. And now uh, this is done again by using uh, Clairvoisin. So remember that her example was a curve in S with peak of S Z times C. And uh, so in this case, K, K1 of C is K, K1 of S equals zero. But in the same time, you can choose, can choose X in uh, the linear system, OS of C, <coughs> with one node. Just one node. You can choose that. And then, um, again by restriction, KK1 of X equals KK1 of S equals zero. Because this restriction applies to any curve, no matter whether smooth or not. And here is the, the example. So X will be in uh, uh, delta zero, and it's outside delta tilde prime K plus one. So that excludes the first, uh, the first case. Okay, and now so. Uh, the, 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 the tilde prime is the, the tilde prime. Uh, that's what we proved, but it was not clear at the beginning. So it could have happened that delta zero was a component in delta, delta d, pr, d prime, d, d tilde prime. So delta zero is irreducible. Yeah, that's uh, that's uh, what we use. Okay. So uh, now we have this. Um, uh, this this result, which generalizes uh, Hirschovitz, Raman, and Vazan uh, in um, um, in the uh, non-smooth case. Now the question is that so here remember that we had the statement was a curve is a limit of uh, k plus one Ganar curves if and only if k k one is different from zero. The general question is that given a uh, stable curve x when of genus g when is it a limit of diagonal smooth curves and the answer was given by Harris and Mumford And it uses abyssal covers. So I'm going to discuss tomorrow um, very briefly the uh, theory of admissible covers and how to compute, how to work with uh, um, linear systems on, uh, or how to work with uh, morphisms. Well, with admissible covers in general. And then uh, give an application. How, uh, so the the application would be the uh, gonality. How to compute the gonality of uh, stable curves? That's Harris Mumford and uh, Green's conjecture for uh, smooth curves with some Brignotter conditions. OK, so I will stop here for, for today. So you will explain the? Yeah, I will explain the, yeah, yes. Yeah, next time tomorrow. <laughs>
D is uh, any number. I, you, you take any number D and you take a family of uh, of curves with gonality D. They might degenerate to, to a stable curve. Well, in general what happens is that whenever you have, you have this uh, stable reduction, which says that whenever you have a family of curves uh, degenerating to something which can be rather nasty, then you can replace the, uh, the central fiber by a, by a stable curve. That's the principle which, uh, which hides actually the, uh, the compactness of uh, mg bar. That's why mg bar is compact. And that's why mg is not compact, because you cannot replace fibers by uh, something smooth. Um, so the question is that when uh, you have a a limiting family <coughs> of curves and uh, pencils, what, what is the limit? So the curves uh, that generate to a curve, to a stable curve, what is the limit of, of these pencils? That's actually the question. Mm -hmm. And the answer is that the, the limit is an admissible cover. Uh, yeah, so for even genus is that, but uh, w uh, it will be comprised in the uh, in this statement. So for even genus, if you take uh, genus 2k and maximal gonality meaning uh, uh, k plus 1, you need an extra condition. You need finitely many pencils. Then uh, green uh, is true. But that's a very tame condition because uh, curves with infinitely many uh, pencils tend to be very, very rare. And if they are, they usually degenerate to there are limits of uh, curves with finitely many pencils. But I, I will explain this tomorrow. So this statement is embedded in the other one, which is more general. So finite many pencils, Clifford index is k plus so Clifford index is uh, so the Clifford index is k minus one. So finally, many pencils, uh, minimal pencils, uh, says that the Clifford dimension is one, because if Clifford dimension is bigger, then you have infinitely many. Yeah, exactly. Yes. Okay, let's thanks again. Thank you. Thank you.